Well, it might have rained on Chaz's big day, but here in West Lanx, we had pretty much end-to-end -end sunshine during May. Now that's truly majestic. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we look at our solar stats for May and update our running total of savings we've made now that we're 10 months into our solar journey. Following that, having signed up to the Octopus Flux tariff at the start of May, we get our geek on and dive into a bit more detail on how it's worked out for us so far. By the way, thanks to everyone who's liked, commented or subscribed so far. It's great to get your feedback and I really do appreciate it. Okay, by royal commandment, let's get started. Last month, for the first time, we generated over 600 kilowatt hours, making May our best month so far. Compared to April, when we generated bang on 400 kilowatt hours, that represents an increase of 50%. From that 607 kilowatt hours, we exported 317, i.e. roughly 52%, which is a massive jump from previous months, where the most we'd exported was 18% back in August last year. Our overall consumption figure of 423 kilowatt hours has clearly been inflated by the significant amount of imported power during the early morning flux rate period. The self-sufficiency figure, that's new terminology adopted in the latest Solis Cloud update, of 261 kilowatt hours is particularly interesting for me as it shows a continued decline in our overall power usage for the month of May having dropped from around 350 kilowatt hours in 2021 to 290 in 2022 and now to 261. Must be doing something right then. Given this was our best month so far, it's hardly surprising that we also had our best day when we generated 27.2 kilowatt hours. I think that's a pretty decent figure from four and a half kilowatts of panels on an east-west layout. Of course, the rough comes with the smooth and our worst day delivered a pitiful 6.4 kilowatt hours. Taking the projected output for May of around 494 kilowatt hours and comparing that to our actual total of 607, we see that we were 23% higher than projected. Looking at what lies behind those figures for a moment, we see that in our region, we experienced somewhere between 240 to 280 hours of sunshine that's between 7.7 .7 and 9 hours each day on average. Although that's interesting, perhaps a more meaningful chart is the one on the right hand side, which displays the amount of sunshine as a percentage of the 91 to 2020 average. It looks like we're just on the edge of the 130% region, which I'd suggest ties in reasonably well with our 23% higher than projected result. Yet more evidence that you can always rely on the weatherman accurately telling you what the weather has been, but not necessarily what it will be. In putting together the second part of this video, I had cause to download the consumption and export data from my smart meter. Having totted everything up, we can see some discrepancies between the smart meter readings and the figures displayed in Solis Cloud. Although not huge, they're not insignificant, being in the range of 2.5 to 4% which does tend to reduce your confidence in the Solis data. I won't bore on about the other aspects of the Solis Cloud update released in May, but if you want to laugh at my rant, feel free to take a look at this video. For any Solis Cloud users who are really interested, take a look at Paul Keeble's post to that video. I'm glad it's not just me that thinks the update was a retrograde step. Finally, if any of you watched my April update, you might remember my little story about the steps I had to take to prevent an overnight frost from wreaking havoc on my tomatoes. Well, I'm glad to report they don't seem to have come to any harm, just in case you'd been worrying. When calculating the savings we were making from our solar panels and batteries, I had set up a nice Excel spreadsheet which could be easily updated each month. Switching over to Octopus Flux, however, threw a spanner in the works, which, combined with Solis putting their ore in as well, has made the job a little bit more difficult. Anyway, putting that to one side, and if I've done my sums correctly, we can see we added around £156 to the total, bringing it to about £756 after 10 months. 
Projecting forwards for the remaining two months, our annual output is looking likely to be around 3,494 kilowatt hours, with a total value of 1,056 pounds. This is about 5% above the initially projected output from the PV GIST tool, and about 9.6% of the purchase price of the system. This suggests we'll achieve payback sometime in year 11. Be great if it was sooner, but it is what it is. As most people watching this are probably already familiar with the Octopus Flux tariff, I won't say too much. This is essentially a tariff with three rate periods. A day rate for the majority of the day, a flux rate between the hours of 2 and 5 a.m. and a peak rate between the hours of 4 and 7 p.m. Import and export are charged at different prices per kilowatt hour for each of these periods. Interestingly, the rates vary ever so slightly depending on your location in the UK. The rates shown are those for the area where I live in the northwest of England. Also worth noting that the day import rate is actually the same as I was being charged under Octopus's flexible tariff. Looking at how our import figures break down, we can clearly see that the bulk of our import occurred during the flux rate period, as would be expected. The total amount of around 161 kilowatt hours averages out at about 6.7 kilowatt hours per day, which correlates well to the 2 hours 40 minutes of charging at a rate of 50 amps, which is equivalent to about 2.4 kilowatts. We incurred pretty minimal import during the day rate period, averaging around 600 watt hours each day. A minuscule 1.1 kilowatt hours sneaked in during the peak rate period, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. Looking in turn at the export figures, the bulk of our export occurred at the day rate. Again, not surprising. However, I hadn't expected such a significant amount of export during the peak rate period which clearly shows the value of exporting at that time, if you can. More on that later. Totting up the numbers shows that overall we achieved a net export value of around £55. Pulling all the numbers together shows we managed to cover all our utility costs, including gas and both standing charges, and still end up being £8.30 better off. Proof, if ever it was needed, that solar power does indeed pay. Right then, it's off to the pub, we'll be able to afford at least a pint. Cheers Constantine! What, if anything then, have we done differently since moving to Flux? Well we haven't gone quite that far, but the first gold star goes to the missus, who worked out how to delay the start of the dishwasher so that the peak energy draw occurred during the flux rate period. Took a bit of trial and error, but we got there after a couple of attempts. Not sure that I deserve one though, as it's only now that I've figured out our fancy oven has two alternate grill settings, and you don't need full inferno to cook just four sausages. A case of RTFM if ever there was one. Where we don't always succeed is delaying using the oven until after 7pm. Sometimes the stomach just overrules the wallet. But no, we haven't changed much else. Nothing that we weren't already doing to maximise our use of the solar power. As I was all keen and enthusiastic, although that soon changed, I downloaded the full month's data from my smart meter, first for consumption, i.e. import, and then for export. This graph shows the average hourly import for each hour slot throughout the day, averaged over the 24 days of the month for which we were on the flux tariff. Took a bit of crunching the numbers around, and I'm not sure it tells us that much we didn't already know, but two things are possibly worth highlighting. We see a small peak between 1 and 2 a.m., which corresponds to the dishwasher starting up. To get the main peak to fall during the three-hour flux rate between 2 and 5 a.m., and allowing for something like a four-hour eco-wash cycle, means there's no way to avoid at least some day-rate power draw when it first switches on. Not going to whinge about it, just a tiny bit frustrating. And it's no use trying to convince the missus to use a shorter program. She rules the dishwasher loading and control with a rod of iron. The second peak of interest corresponds to the typical time slot that the oven is switched on, with a smaller peak just before in the 6 to 7 pm slot, when I can't wait any longer for me sausages. 
On most occasions the batteries can support the draw from the oven, but it's on the edge if you've got the full oven on. You might get the impression I'm counting each watt with a Scrooge-like focus. Nah, this was just for a bit of interest, probably won't bother again. Looking at the corresponding export data, there aren't really any points worthy of note beyond the comment I made earlier where I hadn't expected such a significant amount of export during the peak rate period. The obvious question that does come to mind is whether I can maximise my export value by increasing the amount I export during the peak rate period within the constraints of my current system setup. For example, if I force discharge, let's say for an hour or two from 4 to 5 or 6 p.m., what does that actually achieve and what does it do to the state of charge of the batteries? But for that, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for the next video. But feel free to jump in with any thoughts in the meantime. We'll leave it there for now then. To be continued is the phrase I think they use. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it interesting and informative. Please do like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Cheers, hope to see you again next time.